if um, that sounds okay. Okay. Okay, so we'll get started. And good afternoon to everybody who is joining this webinar or good whatever other time of the day it might be to you. Uh, welcome to this webinar on women's rights in the pandemic, which is one in a series of webinars on resilience, hope and solidarity hosted by Peace Brigades International UK that they've been hosting over the past few weeks. Uh, I might just add that I think all of them have been excellent and very inspiring webinars and I recommend um, viewing them um, on their website. Um, it's a very real privilege to be chairing today's webinar and I thank Susie Bascon of PBI UK for the invitation to do so. Um, first thing I should do is introduce myself. I am Christine Chinkin, I'm a pro professorial research fellow at the London School of Economics Centre for Women, Peace and Security and a former director of that centre. I'm also a member of the Alliance of, for Lawyers at Risk, um, an organisation that defends lawyers, as it sounds like, and which works very closely with Peace Brigades International. I've worked for many years as a researcher, an academic, a teacher on issues relating to women's human rights, especially issues relating to anti-trafficking of women and girls, um, gender-based and sexual violence against women, and women's access to economic, social and cultural rights. And I'm currently working on projects relating to a feminist and a gendered peace. And the long time I've spent working on these various issues and also in a more activist role with women's organisations have made me ever more aware of the extraordinary courage and resilience of those who stand up for women's human rights, for equality, for equal access to land, for social and economic gender justice, for a life free from gender-based violence, um, for their bodily integrity, often in places where to do so exposes them to threats, abuse, being ostracized, physical violence, and even death. Even before the pandemic, currently, the global political climate was making the situation of women's human rights defenders ever more dangerous. The UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders reported in 2019 that women human rights defenders are often the first to come under attack for who they are and for what they do. And now, of course, the global pandemic has added to the hardships that they face and the dangers that are faced by women human rights defenders, which are too often ignored, even added to by the authorities when they are imposing measures for trying to stop the spread of pandemic, such as curfews, isolation, which lead to disproportionate um, dangers for women in these situations. So we have this afternoon four amazing women who will address these and other issues, each from their own particular context and drawing upon their own particular experiences. And it's an extraordinary privilege for me to be um, hosting them this afternoon. So I'll introduce them all in just a minute. And then each one will give a brief five minute account of themselves and their work. And then we will have a more interactive discussion with each of them and then followed by at least some questions um, from the audience. But first I've got a few housekeeping details. Um, interpretation into Spanish is available. Um, there's a globe icon at the bottom of the screen that if people who wish to hear this in Spanish can press on and they will do so. Um, questions from the audience should be sent in via the question and answer um, feature. And they, as I said, there will be time to address at least a couple of those um, at the end of the discussion and other ones can be addressed subsequently by Twitter. Um, it's also useful to look at the chat um, icon, which links to future webinars, um, work about PBI and possibly also making donations. So now I will turn to the very ple pleasurable task of introducing the four speakers. The first speaker is Mandira Sharma, who is from Nepal and who is a co-founder of a Nepalese legal organization, Advocacy Forum. The second speaker is Rachel Wakali from Kenya, 
who is a feminist and a coordinator of the Grassroots Human Rights Defenders Coalition. She is followed by Catherine Ronderos from Colombia, who is an international consultant and an expert on women, peace, security, development, women's human rights in those various contexts. And then finally, we have Pamela Yates from the United States, who's a documentary filmmaker and a co-founder of Skylight. I'd like to welcome all of them to this web webinar, say just how delighted we are to be meeting with them, at least virtually, in this new reality that we have, and look forward very much to hearing all of their contributions. So Mandira, I'll turn to you first for your five minute brief introduction to yourself and to your work. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, let me also join you thanking PBI for hosting this webinar. It's so great to be joined by so many defenders around the globe and also to hear other experiences as well. Uh, I will very briefly touch upon the impact of COVID-19, the measures that have been put in place in countering the spread of the virus on women. Uh, as many uh, countries have experienced, Nepal has also experienced increased number of violence against women. Uh, because of the uh, number of restrictions that have been put in place and al also the uh, restrictions on mobility, none of those uh, cases of violence against women have been really investigated, uh, let alone prosecutions and taking measures to counter them. We also have faced uh, uh, increased cases of maternal mortality. Uh, one of the studies that uh, has been done recently by one of the women's rights organizations shows uh, uh, increase of 200% increase of women's mortality since the country imposed lockdown uh, because of the restrictions uh, and mobility you know that has put on, in, in place not being able to access to hospitals and safe birthing place uh, have impacted women's life quite significantly uh, in, in Nepal similarly uh, we have um, many women working in other countries especially in Gulf. Um, so they have lost their job in those countries and they are stranded in so many different uh, places without ha being able to go to home uh, on, on time so there are many women who had str uh, stranded in number of places so these repatriation flights and the uh, initiatives to really uh, rescue them and to bring home took uh, forever. Um, so many uh, women suffer from uh, health and other uh, related uh, problems. Similarly, we also have situations of women in detention centers and, and prisons. Uh, advocacy Forum does monitor places of detentions and uh, there are increased fears among women of spread of virus in, in that contained kind of places and uh, the measures are not yet put in place to uh, 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 protect them from uh, from from the the virus and also other uh, implications that they they may expose to. Similarly, we also have a problem of um, women uh, being you know uh, uh, rescued from some places and put in quarantine. Unlike in other places, government has. Uh, uh, provided some places where they could be uh, uh, placed in quarantine for a number of days, at least for two weeks. Those places are also not made in a gender friendly way. So there are like male kind of guards and other, other people uh, around that. And there are a number of incidences of sexual abuse even within that. Uh, quarantine places. Um, so we, we, you know, as many other other countries have faced, we have been also struggling with putting, you know, measures in place um, so women could actually um, have access to at least basic kind of uh, health care so their life won't be jeopardized. Um, similarly, we also have situations where, um, um, you know, uh, women not being able to access to medical services and also other uh, j justice kind of apparatus that has actually increased the vulnerability uh, of women in addition to um, other uh, problems that they have been facing. These are on the one side. The, the other side is the excessive use of forces that also impacts women. We have put uh, a number of uh, legislations in, in place that also impacts women. 
On top of that, there is this new law coming into uh, uh, debate that is related to citizenship that actually directly impacts women because it uh, discriminates women and we do not actually have venue and forum to really articulate and oppose those kind of measures that have been put in the in in in, in the con you know in this uh, time of uh, a very strange time of this uh, pandemic so as many other countries we have been also facing all these challenges i'm sure if we have time i will come back to some of these issues again in which women are being impacted as you said health violence um, loss of employment um, various other ways um can you unmute me you're unmuted we hear you you can you hear me yes oh. Right. Okay. And I don't know whether you heard my comments um, with respect to Mandira as the many different ways in which the impact of the um, pandemic is um, disproportionately impacting upon women. So Rachel, uh, if we could turn to you um, and to hear about what's happening um, in Kenya. Hi comrades. Um, thank you so much for PPI UK and also PPI Kenya for organizing this webinar. It's super, super important, uh, especially at this period of time that uh, a lot of us women human rights defenders organizing in different um, grassroots community and the issues that uh, the fact we exist as women and the community that uh, we also support in terms of defending women's rights. So I'll just go directly to the point. One being that uh, the whole COVID, uh, it has taken away the freedom of association and freedom assembly. And if we look back organically on our movement get organized and our women we organize you organize much better when you're together and uh, when also like um we want also to push um, our rights we are more stronger together so if you look on the pandemic side it has taken our rights to assemble and our rights to association and this also takes away the right if for example a woman gets violated within the community level especially now during the time that we have had curfew imposed uh, the kenyan curfew the first one we had that uh, started at seven and most of the community members in Malari, where I come from, and the, the women are casual laborers who are domestic workers. So you find by the time someone has to be laid off by the employer to reach back home, uh, there's a possibility, a lot of cases has been that whereby police are arresting women. And also that um, the, the, also the pressure, the one I've had a comrade saying, the enforcement of force and uh, through this, we have seen a lot of also harassment coming from the same police that are supposed to protect women are the ones also violating women. And with us as Coalition for Grassroots Human Rights Defenders Kenya, uh, being that we are a network of grassroots activists, feminists and community organizer, we have been trying so much to push, to push in different platforms to be able to push the government to look the response of COVID-19 to be in a gender responsive way in a feminist way and a human rights way, whereby would relate better if they are deploying also police women than policemen within our community. Level. The other issue I wanted to talk about was is about violence against women from and girls, uh, from the intimate partners and also the relative that uh, they are living with, with. Like we know clearly, not um, staying also at home is a privilege for most people, and um, and most people that are living in informal settlement. Even social distance is very problematic where we are living. So the fact that most of us have been forced to be confined uh, within the same households, which are 10 by 10 houses, um, you are forced to stay now with the abusers that are violating you in the same house. And now with the issues of, um, of, of also our states using it, especially most of our African states that are, are using it as an excuse of pandemic, if you go to report to the police station, they're like, we can't take in because of the social distance. So instead of also reducing the violence against women, it's sort of catalyzed and increase. And most women and girls now are forced to go back to, to, to stay in the same households with their abuser, with their perpetrator. And psychologically, it torments you and it, it sort of traumatizes you to see that in a nation whereby you're supposed to be valued, respected, as much as of some of our gains as women, 
and being that uh, 2020 was the so the year of also like Beijing class 25, which, which is a gender equality year, mm. it sort of like moves us back instead of moving us forward to where we're supposed to be going as women movement and feminist movement. The other issue is about increase of uh, femicide cases. And this one will be very clear in terms of sex workers uh, within the, 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 in, in Kenya within the informal settlement and some that we've been able to work with uh, during our, our food drive and also like our advocacy level that still continue within the human rights approach and feminist approach whereby some of, I've, I've seen and I've, I've, I've been involved by one of the domestic, of the sex worker leader, two sex workers were killed by their client because the client took advantage of the curfew time, they didn't want to pay and then they killed them. So you can see the level on what also patriarch takes away, um, like it's really sort of violence against women bodies and also like the killing of women. So like in, in, so instead of um, the whole pandemic, uh, being that um, government is looking on how to protect us and put in mechanism, it's also like also the patriarchal system and structures are taking advantage to violate us and violate our bodies. Uh, the other issue I wanted to raise was about increased uh, number of teenage pregnancy. Um, uh, that, could we perhaps look at that one later? Oh, it's fine. Yeah. The teenage pregnancy. Okay. Yeah, okay. the questions. Thank you again very much. And again, showing the um, multiple, multiple ways in which the pandemic is impacting both the civil and political and most importantly, as you've stressed, the violence and for particular um, women in particular situations, the sex workers that you've just suggested and we'll come back to the teenage pregnancies. Um, so thank you very much, Rachel. And now we'll turn to Catherine um, from Colombo. I'm sorry, Columbia. So Catherine, over to you. Catherine? You, you need to unmute, Catherine. Thank you, Pamela. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay. thank you everybody. Um, thank you, Christine. And thank you, PVI, for the invitation. Um, I think it's important to raise a few issues and concerns that we have right now in the current situation. But before I start, I want to explain to you a little bit of the legal framework that we have in Colombia, because it is important to talk about legal frameworks, because sometimes as activists, we normally uh, work and focus on legal frameworks, but sometimes that is not enough. So I want to, to, to share with you that since 2008, um, we have developed very good legislations to attack violence against women. So we have one law on domestic violence. We have one on acid attacks. We have a law on femicides. We have a law on sexual violence in the context of armed conflict. Uh, we have seen increase of women in politics, not, not great as we would like to perhaps as Burundi, but you know, we're getting there. So we have for the first time a woman as vice president. For the first time we have a woman elected as a mayor of the capital city in Bogota. And also for the first time we have 50-50 gender parity at the presidential cabinet. So with these figures, you might say, oh, well, well done everybody in Colombia, you're doing great. But the reality is very different. And this is why my point at the end of this discussion. And also I forgot to mention that we have a helpline, a telephone uh, helpline for victims of uh, any types of gender violence. So as we have heard from all the speakers, there is an increase of violence against women worldwide. So Colombia is not the exception, despite the legislation, the infrastructure and, um, and the resources that we have right now. Uh, mainly, we have obviously uh, um, unemployment of women, which is the highest we have seen in decades. So sectors like the textile, the tourists have been the most affected. So women are the first one to lose their jobs. And also the informal economy, street vendors, women who, you know, live day by day. Those are the ones who have been more affected. And we in Colombia, we don't have job support. So this is very, very difficult for uh, providing services and, you know, people in these uh, conditions relied on um, 
charity donations, you know, you name it. Uh, working moms also have um, triple, you know, the triple burden for women. Uh, the working hours have been increased. The pressure has been increased, especially for working moms at homes. But those women households, um, uh, women at the household who also contribute to the unpaid work, mainly in the care economy, have been facing most of the challenges and the pressure of the, of the, of the situation and also mainly um, have been victims of domestic violence. So I just want to raise for you that um, the helpline has, been an, has received an increase of 230% of the calls that on a regular basis, um, every 25 hours there is a femicide attempt, every 10 minutes there is a report on domestic violence, every 25 minutes there is a report on sexual violence, and this is women all ages. But if you are under 18, obviously the rate increases. So this is overwhelming for the infrastructure and for the legal system. So before the pandemic, the system, you know, it works, but not perfectly, it's not effective, it's very slow, very corrupted, and obviously women take the blame, 99% of the cases, so only 4% 4, 4 of the cases end in sentences. Um, so, for example, during the lockdown since March in Colombia, we have seen 113 femicides and 80% of those cases were women who reported previously the violence and the harassment. So this shows us that the legal framework and the structure is very inefficient, is not working properly. Because if 80% of the women reported, those women can be, to be saved um, instead of, instead of date. So now, we, before the pandemic, 75% of cases of domestic violence and general violence against women were happening in the household. So can you imagine right now when in the lockdown, the, the levels have exploded, have increased. It's not like it didn't exist. It has always existed, but it's now visible because it's now in the news. Everybody's talking about, we now have resources like the social media, so women are reporting because the police is efficient, uh, they don't come on time, and if they do, nothing happens. So, so our strategies at the moment? Again, can we look at the strategies <laughs> after that a very powerful introduction that you've just made? Uh, thank you very much. And I think the shocking statistics that you have just been citing are just overwhelming and emphasizing that a legal system of its own is certainly not enough to address the issues that we've got. We'll come back to the strategies and so on in just a moment. So Pamela, from a very different pers perspective, um, that of a documentary filmmaker, if we, you could have your um, brief introduction. Sure, I am um, the co-founder and creative director of Skylight, which is a nonprofit human rights media organization based in Brooklyn, New York. And we make feature length documentary films. May, most of our protagonists are women. We really are focused on highlighting the stories of women whose stories may not have been told in the mainstream media. Often they're lost to history. And um, the film that we're working on right now is called Borderland. So Borderland is absolutely no exception to this. Um, as many of you know, not only are is the pandemic running wild in the United States. In fact, we're having now a second wave. 40,000 new cases were um, judged positive yesterday. Um, and it's spreading across the country and may come back to where the epidemic started. But not only that, we're also having a national uprising, as many of you I'm sure have heard, led by Black Lives Matter. And as many of you may know, Black Lives Matter was started by three black women. So women are very much in the forefront of this national uprising. What does this mean? It means there have been protests in 2000, not only cities, but suburban areas and small towns as well. Um, this is a, a movement to stop the violence 
not only the death of George Floyd, but of the violence that we've seen against black, brown, people of color, indigenous people over the years, it's come to a tipping point. And so the question is, how can we take advantage of this moment and make it into a sustainable movement? Um, the other thing that's happening with Black Lives Matter and all of the allies around the Black Lives Matter movement is that they are addressing the violence done to women who have often been left out of the narratives about police violence. The film I'm working on, Borderland, is really about people in the United States <clears throat> who are defying US government policies around immigration. And one of the touch points of this movement now is to free people in immigration detention. They've committed no crime. It's a civil offense, but the coronavirus is um, impacting them really heavily. And I wanna show you, I wanna cede a minute and a half of my time to the women in <laughs> a ICE detention facility in South Louisiana who have stood up, have been on hunger strike, are in resistance. And I'm just gonna share my screen with you now to show you this short video. So as you can see, the guards uh, tried to shut them down. They later punished them and put four of the women into solitary confinement, but the women have not stopped. And this is spreading to other detention centers around the, around, around the country um, where there is now many more cases and there have been um, two deaths in um, immigration detention. So um, I, I can leave it there because we can, yeah. We can, we can talk more about this, um, but we want to be able to support the women who are um, protesting against the violence, against them, against us, and um, really trying to make this sustainable and keep going and defund the police and make real systemic change. Thank you, Pamela. And I think you've already demonstrated the power of images. And we'll come back to that one um, again in just a moment. Um, so you've all made um, some very powerful um, points about the impact of the pandemic on women. I think what's striking is how much commonality there is. And it may well be that you would like to comment as well on what each of you have said. And certainly feel free if you want to pick up on anything that any of your fellow panelists have made. But we'll just have another sort of quick um, going um, for some additional points from you all. So Mandira, um, you, you're in an, an organization advocacy forum where clearly law is one of the um, strategies, one of the tools that is used to advance women's human rights. And yet we also heard um, from Catherine about the inadequacies of law. So how do you as an NGO, um, how do you use law as a, an active tool 
against so many of the um, issues that you've raised earlier. Thank you, Christine. Yes, I think uh, monitoring documentations and uh, using law uh, are the two major strategies that we have been uh, using now because uh, most of those violations that I mentioned earlier uh, uh, were not uh, widely reported because of social stigma and our family kind of structures and other social barriers. Uh, women um, do not report that, that that easily because even if you report, nothing will happen. You know, so except you know yeah. having more troubles. So um, we have established ourselves as a uh, organizations doing monitoring and documentations, having a sort of trust of, of women who, who, who we could reach out to or who could reach out to us in, in terms of uh, reporting their cases safely. So first thing is really documenting, monitoring what is happening. And on, on the basis of that, we actually develop different legal strategies. So for example, on, on, um, on a number of measures that have been put in place, um, uh, in, in, in the context of a uh, pandemic, we have actually uh, brought number of read petitions in the Supreme Court. Although a lot of this regular kind of work of the courts are also suspended, uh, reads uh, like extra uh, um, um, kind of uh, measures that the court allows if it is related to COVID-19 that are actually uh, functioning. So judiciary does respond to, to those issues. So uh, lawyers across the country have been bringing um, petitions in, in the Supreme Court. For example, we brought the, uh, the uh, petition in the Supreme Court challenging the excessive use of forces by the security forces in, in the name of uh, maintaining uh, lockdown, for example or the, you know, enforcing the, the legal measures um, uh, on, on lockdown. Uh, there were a number of cases of, of police brutality, torture, uh, and ill treatment. So we actually brought the case um, in the Supreme Court seeking order against the police so they could actually restrain their, their measures, their, their behavior, um, so the people are actually uh, uh, safe from torture and, and detention. So there was a positive uh, um, response from the Supreme Court uh, ordering police to take measures in, in place, to put measures in place so uh, those excessive use of force uh, uh, is contained. Similarly, um, women uh, were uh, not able to access to safe uh, birthing places, for example. Um, so we also challenged that, bringing a case in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has then issued the order against the government to put the mm -hmm. regulations in, in place. So they actually prioritize this uh, and put measures in place so women have safe and easy access to uh, the hospitals, for example. Similarly, uh, there are reads uh, challenging uh, the measures, insufficient measures or lack of measures in terms of rescuing those women who were stranded in border area for a number of days. Um, so there was intervention uh, from, from, from the Supreme Court. Uh, so we have actually brought more than 50 uh, wow. uh, petitions, uh, you know, not only us, there are like number of legal organizations, lawyers, you know, we forge our airlines, we support each other in terms of challenging a number of these, uh, these uh, uh, measures that have been restricting people's um, life, people's rights um, through, the, through the court. So um, yeah, that's what I wanted to uh, share. Thank you. <laughs> that, that's very inspiring as well. Uh, Rachel, you were about to tell us about the issue of teenage pregnancies uh, when we ran out of time. So maybe you'd like to pick up on that. But um, more broadly as well, um, clearly with your work um, in the informal settlements, um, you certainly um, have been looking at issues of gender justice. And I think from your account a moment ago, that seems to be um, sadly lacking in many ways. What, what, how would you perceive an approach that focused on gender justice? What, what, how, would that, how would you see that working out? I think, uh, thank you so much. I think if you, def, um, to answer you just clear and directly, uh, that had to come from a political will of our president uh, when they came with the intervention and also the Ministry of Health, because you can't also like uh, sort of avoid um, also sexual reproductive health and women and also health, look in terms of the lives of women and maternal health and everything. And for me, I would say, if you are putting this kind of curfew and mechanism, even from the interior security, they would have looked like, if you are putting this kind of intervention, how does it affect different groups of women? Because women, we are not homogeneous. And uh, if they didn't do that, it means they don't care about us. 
And that's why like, uh, you have seen even like uh, most of us women human rights defenders, because of the level of the community we are coming from and what we believe in and what we stand for, we have to sort of like shift and look alternative ways to support our community. And I'm happy also to see like uh, people like Comrade Edita here, watch the amazing work she's doing in Kibra and our team, the work we are doing in community. Now we have to shift um, uh, from now directly dealing with women's rights issue and human rights issue to humanitarian way or now we can be able to support community, but in a gender justice and responsive way of feminism. And this is where by looking access to contraceptive, access to sanitary towels, because this COVID period yeah. is not safe, we have to continue menstruating. But if you had laid off these girls from school and you didn't like, I, I agree like even the first procedure, the disbursement of menstrual, hygiene, my menstrual health hygiene management product wasn't that effective. But if you deployed girls now to go to school, uh, to go back home without even like giving them like some of the packages to be able to use at home, what are you saying? You're forcing now like the Britishers who are men in the community to sort of use that uh, in terms of power and privilege for the transactional sex, which now has led to a lot of also like a, um, early teenage pregnancy. Like now we have, I saw statistically in the, on the news that we have more than 10,000 teenage young mothers. You can imagine what kind of a crisis is that? Mm -hmm. What kind of a crisis, like how are we as a society, as a country, we have wasted the life of young future generation that was depending on the country to protect them. And then if you look also, most of these cases, some come from development from relatives and rape cases. Because also like we don't have the facility like safe houses that are government owned or government operated. The existing ones are like from civil society organizations, social movement. They have run out of capacity and resources. So if we could have had this mechanism being put, even part of the essential services, uh, the ones the government was putting in Kenya, they would have put like gender responsive, way, if they're having cases of violence, to be part of gender, uh, to be part of essential services, but they didn't put that as part of essential services. The helpline, even the advocacy level, and even like if the, the, the way, the one thing we saw, which for me also I found it to be uh, very problematic as a feminist and as a woman human rights defender, and also which makes me see also like also myself, I'm not safe, and most of women human rights defenders that are organizing, when the minister, minister of Health was able to say, we have seen the Chief Justice uh, saying we have increased cases of violence against women and girls. Now it's the role of religious leader. You don't, like, you don't shift the responsibility of an institution to the patriarchal existing systems and uh, structure that has been working, also in violating women. So I think, but I'm impressed. One thing that also we need to celebrate, I'm impressed on now women human rights defender being able to change the narrative. Like for example, as Coalition for Grassroots Human Rights Defender, looking on the murals that uh, we did in a partnership with Madara Roots uh, Initiative, we had to put a political statement of having a, um, a woman human rights defender and a feminist uh, holding their thumb and on the left of taking back the power. And also like uh, showing the picture within the community, how women, whether it's medic, uh, whether it's nurses, whether it's within the community leadership, in different spaces, even like the unpaid care work that most of us have been doing, and now you've been responding, but because of the system that are working against us, there's not that visibility. Even if you look at the media also, and now they're giving visibility, it's not amplifying the role women human rights defenders are doing the community levels, or the role um, women are doing to ensure like uh, there's no spread of COVID, but finding alternative ways they're able to support community. So much respect to all of you comrades for what you're doing in different initiatives. We inspire each other, and solidarity is our only weapon in checking on each other. I think that's uh, um, not just inspiring each other, but very much inspiring all of us who are listening um, as well. So Catherine, you were about to talk about some strategies that you're about going to address. And perhaps also you could pick up on what Rachel has just been talking about with respect to human rights defenders and sort of what, what are human rights defenders in Colombia um, also um, facing and how are they responding? Yes. So before I start with that, just wanted to clarify that um, the point I want to raise is that legal system is important, but our work doesn't end there. Mm. You know, it's a big step, but it doesn't finish there because even as I will show you in the case of Colombia, we have a great, the best legislation ever. But if it's not working, it's like nothing. So the work doesn't end 
in there. So we need to bring our governments accountable. Yeah. So in terms of women human rights defenders in Colombia, um, it's very sad that situation has been worsened to women human rights defenders, despite that we have signed a peace agreement in 2016, and we have the highest hopes that this situation will change, but we know the peace is very difficult because behind that there are, there are a lot of powers, economic mafias, and etc. It's not a good will from the heart. So of course, many women human rights defenders, mainly who defend uh, the land, the territories, environmental rights, where the money is, because the natural resources is where the money is, are the ones facing the biggest challenge. So if you compare the rate of threats and killings of women you know, versus men, of course it's, it's lower, you know, it's not the biggest mm. number of men. But what you need to look at is the level of threats and killings of women is increasing a higher rate than the men. So we need to look out. This is an early warning system. According to the Ombudsman Office, during 2020 this year, we have already seen 106 attacks um for women human rights defenders 95 life threats three killings attempts and six killings so the figures compared to men obviously is very low but the point is that women are getting more visible more vocal are participating more and as my sister rachel from Africa, from Kenya, she said, like, as women are starting to speak up, you know, the yeah. risk increases. So this is the case for women human rights defenders. So women face um, violence in the home, in the political life, in the streets, because we're not supposed to go out in the nights or in the day. So where are women safe? We're not safe anywhere. <laughs> We were told to stay at home, but we were at home and we're not, not safe. safe. What's going on? What's the problem? So people here in, in, in Colombia and in all war countries, you know, security is very linked to the military. And in our brain, somehow, if we don't have a strong military, we don't have security. And this is also a huge, huge risk for women and mainly women in the rural areas and indigenous women. I don't know if you have seen in the news lately, mm. uh, the case of a rape of indigenous girl, 13 years old by seven soldiers. She was kidnapped for two days. This is not the first time that this is happening. You know, killing and rapes of girls is happening every day, about 50 cases per day across the country. And, you know, during the armed conflict, the cases of sexual violence by the military is huge and also, you know, against um, indigenous women and indigenous girls. So even the military doesn't provide security. You know, it's a militarized country. Everything, all the responses are made with arms, with guns. So now to the strategies, Christine, I think we need to be very smart because I'm sorry, <laughs> can, you, can you just very, very quickly, sort of half a minute, because we are, we need to have so much longer to discuss the importance of all of these issues. So we need more um, feminist women in politics, not just women, feminist women in politics and in the justice system and in the legal system. We need a strategic training. It's not about gender training to the police and the military and men in the legal system and the judiciary. It's a strategic training. Uh, we're using a lot of social media, so this is a strategy for women to create collective action and create the atmosphere of pressure for holding our, our governments accountable. And finally, we need to start looking at self-help and community protection from the local context. I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Um, that, that was a very good quick of some of the strategies, and again, we could develop all of them. But uh, Pamela, how, um, you know, you're obviously um, coming at this from a different perspective, equally concerned about the need to protect women and to respond 
and to enhance women's human rights. How does documentary and films add, add as another tool that we can use in these ways? Sure, thanks, Christine. And, and uh, it's been a pleasure listening to all my colleagues. Um, I am a documentary filmmaker, but I'm also a human rights defender. And uh, I don't see those two as mutually exclusive. I mean, we have lawyers who um, use law in defense of human rights, and we filmmakers use art and documentary film stories in the defense of human rights. So that's really where um, I come down. I believe in the power of story. I believe in the power that a great film can have to go out and affect millions of people emotionally, but that's not enough because we have to go someplace with those emotions. And that's why it's a real pleasure to work with all of you because you are developing the strategies. We can help activate the people. We can help bring up the emotion. We can help tell the stories that tell the true stories of women's lives and what, what are the roots of what is happening and what are the roads that we can take forward to change that. So I'll um, leave it there, Christine, because I know we want to have a lot of interaction with people and I want to have interaction with people too. And I know everyone listening wants to um, talk to the, the brilliant women here. Oh yeah, thank you very much. And certainly I'd echo what you've just said about how inspiring all, I could talk to all of you for very much longer. Um, turning to the organizers, do we have questions from, um, from the audience? Do we have any questions? Um, Theo, or uh, do we have questions to coming in? We haven't received any questions from the audience. Um, do any of the panelists have any? Well, maybe the panelists. I mean, we would. I would um, suggest because um, so many of the issues that have been raised, whether any of you would like to respond to the comments that have been made by others. So we've talked about women's human rights defenders, in particular, um, Rachel and Catherine. Uh, I'm sure Mandira would have um, added things to add about human rights defenders. We've talked about the role of law. We've talked about community strategies and how women within their own environment are responding, are mobilizing, are acting in solidarity with each other, and how women are working together to try to, on the one hand, use what laws are available, and on the other hand, to try and push governments um, to respond to, to end the impunity that exists so often with respect to violations of women's human rights. So who would like to come back in on any of those issues? I think maybe I can go. Yes, Perhaps. certainly, Rachel. Okay. <laughs> um, like, like for me, like what I would also like, like to add is the expectation that has been put on women, human rights yeah. defender from the public and also the movement itself. And the movement itself, I'm trying to look um, the kind of trauma that also it has been able to sort of um, come in, in terms of now most of women human rights defenders now have to go through some trauma, depression and anxiety. Because like the way I'd say it, and the majority of women human rights defenders in Kenya that you're doing, like it's more community work, trying to find how community can be fed since there's no like uh, government support or access to right to food. So you find um, the pressure that comes with it is too much. Um, the pressure that comes from the society also itself is too much. And uh, being that majority of also women, you might defend this work, the volunteer, yeah, in Kenya, like a paid eight to five job. And since you live within the community level, you cannot say like, I'm only dealing up to this level and not to this level. Despite the SCAFI community expect, collectively you're able to be there physically present. And uh, this now also co comes back now to our mental well-being. We are defending people who is defending us. Uh, in terms of, we are listening to people's traumatic story. We are, the story that we are picking, the, the violation that you are documenting, they are very traumatic. And we are comforting people who is comforting us. 
And uh, being mm -hmm. that also our society, the way I said, based on private sphere, and especially if you come as a strong woman, people see you as problematic and you get victimized. So for me, it's just to echo the fact that um, all of this work is continuing. Still, um, I don't want to also like uh, say, uh, the thing we need also to continue organizing women on pain. Yes, we are at rich. We are fighting because we have anger of a liberation that we want to see. But also like, um, also it's important, like the stories that are coming in, listening from comrades from all over, we bring more of this story even to the, from the like intergenerational sort of story. So the young feminists that are organizing in different spaces, like the way we have different uh, professionals and different um, uh, women working in different space, we are able to sort of um, push our struggle forward and hear each other and uh, sort of um, feel you're not alone. Because it has been crazy for most of us, working 18, hour, 18 hours a day is not a joke. So that yeah. some of us, like I had to like sort of take um, some have to go on sleeping pills because it has to a point in Somia, it's, it's on your way. But I believe with that, this collective power will move far. Yes, the, as you say, the huge expectations that are always on women and very frequently the mental toll is not given enough um, consideration. Who else would like to come in? Mandira or Catherine, Pamela? Would you like to either add or in, on any of the other points that you would yeah, like I just, to Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to what Rachel had to say, which is um, we don't often do this. I think we have to um, mark our defeats, but we also have to celebrate our victories. Yeah. So for example, this movement, uh, the movement is called Free Them All, which um, intersects with the Black, Black Lives Matter, is the movement to free immigrants from immigration detention because of COVID-19. It just means that they would be set free and they would be free to pursue their asylum cases in the United States. That didn't happen and we're still advocating for that. But what did happen was that 700 people out of the 3,700 were freed and a higher court has decided that all the children in immigration detention, and yes, there are thousands of them, have to be let go. Um, they're, we're trying to get them to be, let, to be freed with their parents. That's been a whole other struggle, but for right now, that moment is. So, you know, it's this balance between these two things. I feel often that we, um, our victories are so few and far between. You know, that we have to um, definitely uh, commemorate them because it really helps with the self-care and inspires us. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And the word you used earlier, let's celebrate when we do have something um, to do so. So Mandira, Catherine, would you each like to have a sort of final, we've got sort of about three or four minutes left, just each to have a final comment as well. So uh, Mandira, perhaps you first. Yeah, I think I absolutely agree with Rachel. Uh, uh, the work is so demanding and also the expectation is so high. Um, uh, I think, and also we, we often have to deal with the situations of all those uh, miseries and you know, violence and, and suffering of our people. I think we have to find every uh, little things to celebrate as well. And there are things actually, um, you know, despite all these difficulties uh, in, in Nepal, we have made judiciary aware of the of the situation. We made them respond quickly on some of these uh, issues, which in itself is, is sort of huge success. That's how I would like to uh, uh, take it. So it's not only having a sort of good decisions or rulings from the court. I think the way you educate judiciary on some of these issues is also very, very important. And that will last uh, quite a long period of time in the judiciary. So I think uh, I absolutely agree that we need to find ways to celebrate our little success because these are the ones to keep us uh, going. I think that's if we go back to the um, title of this webinar series, Resilience and Hope and Solidarity. I think those are all absolutely core to these notions of celebration. So Catherine, uh, any final words? Sure, so what I wanted to uh, aimed this, this, this dialogue is, um, I think worldwide, the violence against women, one every three women um, experience violence throughout their lives. So it's a huge, huge amount. And there is no public services that really could support and cover all that huge demand. 
So we need to also focus our energy in changing stereotypes. We need to work on education, on strategic training to both women and men. It's not just men, it's not just women, to both. Mm. We need to start at early, early ages. Obviously, the work that Pamela is doing, working in the media, because the media is so contaminated with, with wrong stereotypes of women, with wrong stereotypes of men. And if we start with that in the literature, in the culture, everywhere. So we need to start challenging. Every time we talk about, you know, violence against women, human rights, women's rights to everybody, with our family, with our partners, with our friends, Everybody, because it's so contaminated, the patriarchy is so strong and big and is, is everywhere that we need to start as soon as possible about changing the stereotype because any law, any public services, nothing will have the capacity, nothing will have the capacity to overcome that. So it's up to everybody, both men and women. Absolutely. Anybody else just want to make any other final comments? Yeah. Can I go? Yes. Yeah, I think like some of the intervention you are just, it's just like what I dream. We need feminist government with feminist policy all over and with feminist leaders. Absolutely. And I think on that note, as you say, a vision, a dream, and one that I think has to keep inspiring um, and all the work that you are all doing. Anybody else just want to, I think we could have sort of about half a minute left if anybody would just like to make one final comment. Well, there is a comment about intersectionality. Of course, we are all cross with intersectionality and in a culture so mixed here in Colombia with uh, indigenous, black, mestizo, you know, we live in intersectionality world and we also face racism with the issue of the rape of the indigenous girl is, is telling you the level of racism there is in the institutions, in our, in our minds, in our culture. So violence against women also need to transcend. It's not about men and women, it's about all the levels of um, discrimination and it's about it's about rights, everybody being equal, like the Black Lives Matter, you know, all those issues are telling us something, that something is wrong right now. So, you know, this discussion needs to continue, and I think this is a good opportunity to start looking at those in a, in a more holistic way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we are out of time. I would very much like to go on talking to with and between all of you as well with so many important ideas and the importance of the work that you're all doing. Um, so it just remains for me to thank you all very much indeed for joining this webinar. Thank you, Christine. And um, to wish you all um, every um, with the work that you are doing and for the rest of the day. So thank can you very much. Can we, can we join hands by putting our hands on both sides of the frame? All That's of the a, sisters across the world. Th that's a yeah, lovely idea. Good. Thank you, Pamela. All right, thank you. Thank Goodbye, you. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Lots of love and And again, a wonderful image. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs>